<laughs> Did you hear about that cruise ship that docked? New Jersey, three yeah. cases. Oh, my God. Rob Cohen, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How you doing, brother? I'm good, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's such an honor to have you on, man. I mean, we're close friends, but I I grew up on your films, and you're one of my all-time favorite directors, and I mean, everything that you've done is so iconic and prolific, you know, what... I mean, God, what you did with The Fast and the Furious, I don't think anyone could have ever fucking predicted that it would have just built the most successful universal franchise <laughs> of all time. And then Triple X, The Skulls, I mean, Dragon Heart, everything you've done, The Wiz, I mean, man, it, it, you're so iconic and you, you, you have so much history. You know, I'm so excited to talk to you about everything, but before we kind of dig in, I'm, I usually like to start at the beginning. You, where did you grow up? I grew up in upstate New York here at, in Cornwall on Hudson, New York, right by West Point. Okay. On the Hudson wow. River. Yeah, so, you know, I... Were you, did one of your parents go to West Point? Um, no, my father was in the, had been in the Army, but um, he was, wanted to be a furniture manufacturer, and I think he got cheap space near Cornwall. Oh, really? <laughs> that's, that's how we wound up there. And how was enjoy like, was that enjoyable experience growing up there, or did you kind of have a desire to escape? Well, you know, g growing up in a small town and going to a public high school, small, smallish, um, you kind of, I kind of got hungry for the larger world. Yeah. And especially when I started to really take film seriously, uh, when I was 12 or 13, you know, when I saw Lawrence of Arabia or The Great Escape, well, those movies were like, whoa, yeah. there's, there's a whole other world out there. It's not all Cornwall and Hudson, New York. Who who was like uh, curating these kind of f film experiences for you? My you? father, actually. Wow. So yeah. were, were your parents into the arts or were they artists? or? No, my father just found movies relaxing for him. Wow. And he didn't he didn't have a lot of hobbies or... He was very into his business. He was a very good man, but you know, typical of that post World War II, get home, get home from Europe, put away what you saw yeah. dead, and you know, get the home built and marry the woman and have the three kids and you know, build a business and. And know. was he kind of pushing you down that path? Yeah, he would have loved yeah. it if I had gone in. He he actually made that business the furniture business. He started very, very successful. He was onto modular design before anybody even thought of it. Wow! You know, and it's in a funny way he was like thinking like IKEA. No way! Back in the fifties. Wow! And what did your mother do? She worked with him. Oh, she did. Okay. Yeah, wow. it, it was very typical, you know, veterans of World War Two. Yeah. Kind of thing. And then, at what point did you kind of feel like, you know, that calling of like? This is kind of what I think I need to do with my life. Well, you know, my first dreams were like, I'm going to go and be like Lawrence of Arabia. I'm going to go to exotic places and do great <laughs> things. You know, I was 12. Yeah, of course. You know, I had the fantasies of all this. And then one day I realized I don't want to be Lawrence of Arabia. I want to be David Lean. I want to make the film. Pop, totally. You know, so... I started fooling around with the 8mm home camera, nice. you know, so yeah. same story as Spielberg, totally. same, same thing. Wow, and, and some of those films, were you kind of just casting your friends? And Yeah, everybody, yeah. my sister, my friends, you know, it, it, and I was doing, you know, I was animating the titles. Wow. I was doing, I was trying to advance, but the thing that happened is when I first shot the first narrative film yeah and i took a shot of this person and a shot of that person and spliced them together and i knew they weren't even the same in the same room at the same time wow and they seemed to be talking to each other i went wow this is powerful yeah this medium is really complex and really powerful and i was bitten Did, by that bug and never lost it were there any like teachers in high school that were kind of uh, cultivating you and 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 helping you along with that journey because i imagine you know in cornwall being an artist can be i'm sure everyone's going to be a lawyer doctor teacher well we had a an art teacher 
a guy named Richard Graham. Yeah. And wherever you are, Dick Graham, thank you. <laughs> and his beautiful wife, Lenny. And I got to know them. And, you know, I would go to their home after school or on the weekends. And they were hippies. Yeah. They were proto-hippies. They were in that that area between beatniks and, and hippies in the, in the late, mid to late 70s. So um, I, I got this vision of an artistic life because he was a sculptor and she was a painter. Yeah. And they lived in this sort of lofty bohemian. And yeah. I, and she was very pretty and very sexy. Oh, love it. And, and <laughs> I went, okay, this art business isn't so bad. Yeah. You know, and then you went to the greatest school of all time, which I'm still so jealous of, Harvard. Yeah, how was well, that? That was amazing. You know, I had always adored John F. Kennedy. Yeah, and so I wanted to go to Harvard all my adolescent life. Yeah, and uh, it was an amazing day when I got in. Were, were you a big like a uh, well? deserving student in high school did you work really hard and yeah that? you know I, the thing was i worked like i was interested in other things yeah like the theater i was acting yeah which, you have some great credits uh, <laughs> fast and furious triple x some of the best i'm the, pe I'm the pizza boy <laughs> and the colombian drug dealer I'm a yeah, colombian yeah. drug yeah. lord oh and, and the skulls you're the teacher right yeah, was, <laughs> <laughs> so fine you know, acting career right, right here right <laughs> Director is a hobby. Yeah. Well, well, it's just, you know, um, as, as one has heard, uh, directors are just men too short to be actors. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'm stealing that. So what, what was Harvard like? I mean, you know. It was very um, tumultuous in those days. You know, because that was sixty-seven to seventy-one. Was that before that was, integration? Or no, no, oh. it, no. It was the height of the anti-Vietnam okay. anti-war okay. movement. Got it. In sixty-eight, you know, the students took over the university occupation. Hall and we had riots, and we had tear gas, and we had bloody heads and bloody noses Whoa. from people being hit by the Cambridge riot police. And, oh my God! You know, it was a it was a, a very emotionally violent uh, time. Yeah. And I made that movie, my first film about it, called A Small Circle of Friends. Wow. Which uh, was Karen Allen and Brad Davis and Jameson Parker. Yeah. It was a love triangle going through Harvard during these years, 67 to 71. And was there a film track at Harvard? Was that what you were... They didn't really have that. Yeah, because you know, now they're at every school, but I didn't... Yeah. Harvard was like, we're not a trade school. Right. And in truth, I tell kids today, don't go to film school. Yeah, so you still believe that. I, I, I agree with I that. I feel, get life experience. Yeah. Be a journalist. Yeah. I studied anthropology, which I got to tell you has helped me more than anything I could have ever imagined. Yeah. Way more than studying what, Especially what now. John Ford did or what Howard Hawks did. It was like, wait, how do you analyze a culture? How do you analyze a subculture? Yeah. How do the people work within it? So if you look at my films, you got Fast and Furious, let's say, which is about this secret subculture totally. of rice rockets yeah. and aftermarket. Uh, engineering of, of Japanese imports. So it's, it's its own subculture. It has its own language. It has its own customs. And when you study anthropology, you get tools to try to figure out how a tribal culture works. Yeah. And then, you know, when I did Dragon the, uh, Dragon the Bruce Lee story, yeah. that was a martial arts culture. Totally. And I'm not a martial artist, so I had to get in there and find out what the truth was of Jeet Kune Do, of Bruce's life, how Bruce's contemporaries looked at him, and how to create the legend, you know, in my in film. And I wrote that, too. Um Skulls, yeah. Secret societies, elitists. Were there, were, were there a lot of those at Harvard as well? There were eating clubs that were exclusive, but but in at Yale and other places, there are 
full on secret societies yeah. like, like we portrayed, like Skull and Bones. And there still is. The Skull and Bones still, is still a still very there. real thing. Yeah. The and one. you know, when you know that the CIA was founded by Skull and Bones yeah. <laughs> because Bill Donovan, he knew that those Skull and Bones guys knew how to keep secrets. Wow. And they're trained to keep secrets. Yeah. And so you realize that there's more there. And, of course, if you ever read C. Wright Mills' The Power Elite, you look at these elites and how they interact, how they're formed in, in these prep schools and, you know, Ivy League schools and so on. These men and women these days, you know, they're joined like links in a chain. Totally. On an invisible chain. And, you know, I, I was trying to make the skulls about George H.W. Bush who would be Craig T. Nelson? Yeah, and and George W. Bush, the fuck the, up, the father. Oh, the Paul Walker character. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. that was Paul Walker. So what they were doing is trying to cover up Junior's fuck ups, so that he had a chance <laughs> to, <laughs> to succeed to, and get to, to be an important <laughs> yeah. guy in the future. Yeah, you know? totally. So. Well, so after Harvard, what what was this up for you? Did you go to L.A. right after that, or the day after? The day after, I got my like diploma on like June twenty eighth and or June twenty second, and I flew to Hollywood on the twenty third. And were you while you were at Harvard? Were you interning anywhere? Did you kind of build something? I had been a PA for a wonderful director named Daniel Petrie. Wow! And you know Dan Dan was one of those men that. You can't find much anymore. He yeah. was a very loving, collegiate, kind of avuncular guy who who took me under his wing. He's your artistic father, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I, I was getting his coffee and of course you know, doing all the the schlepping. Wow! But but when I saw him get up on a big Titan crane and shoot the opening shot of this movie. TV movie he was directing and I was PAing. Wow. I went, that's me. I, I got to be that. This is what I want to do. I want to tell stories with a camera and and with actors and and I'm going to be that. Yeah. And so what what were the steps for you to get to there? You you started producing, right? Yeah. And well, you know, I got out I found the sting. I mean, these are all long stories. Yeah. But I found a script nobody was paying any attention to, and I championed it till finally it got in the right hands, and it became the sting. And then I became the kid who found the sting, wow. and I got a call from 20th Century Fox to go over to their, to the studio yeah. to try to find fresh new material. And while I was there, I realized they weren't doing television movies. So, which used to be the the biggest thing. All the networks had a television. I think it was like once a week, right? All over the yeah, place. But yeah. This was the beginning of the ABC and CBS movie of the week. Yeah. And we weren't doing them at Fox. And so, in one of the ballsier moves, I just called up Barry Diller, who was the head of ABC. Wow. And I said, Hi, I'm the head of television movies at Fox. I want to come in and sell you a few movies. And he went, we were wondering when Fox would, you know, and, and I went over there and sold a movie and got a blind commitment. And then I did the same thing to Philip Barry over wow. at CBS. And pretty soon I had four TV movies. And when the, the word hit the higher ups, they were not happy. <laughs> Savage, I love it, brother. Know, it yeah, like, it was like a. But that's you know when you're young, you have to have that kind of confidence, and you got to make moves like that. And I, I felt I was like a guerrilla warrior. In yeah, this you Hollywood were Hollywood setting. And anyway, Bill Self, my boss, brought me in, and he, you know, he just said. I didn't want to be in this business, and now you've put us in this business, and there's no way for us to get out without a lot of embarrassment. But you probably figured that out, didn't you? Yeah. And I, I said, well, I had a hunch, yeah. but we should be in this business. And I did my spiel about why, and he finally looked up and he said, I have two choices. I can fire you, which is what I should do, or I can make you the vice president of television movies, which is what I'm. I suppose I have to do. Wow! 
And I, he said, which would you prefer? I know the yeah. VP. Yeah. He goes, and no more money. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so was The Wiz a television movie? No. Well, it wasn't. No. Okay. No, okay. but through my dealings with ABC on those movies, Barry Diller was a friend of Barry Gordy's. Got it. And one day Diller called me and said his friend Barry Gordy was looking for a young guy to help them get into the movie business. M- like Motown? Motown Record wow. Company. No way. So I went over and met Barry, which was magical. He's yeah. an amazing, Iconic. amazing man. But he's just a great man. Yeah. You know, a visionary. He, a visionary. Yeah. But as a human being, he's just a rich, full, complex man, full of warmth and humor and anger and toughness and all the diametric opposed elements yeah. that, that can make a dynamic personality i loved him he became like a father figure and we worked side by side for five years and we wow. made mahogany and the whiz and thank god it's friday and the bingo long traveling all-stars wow and scott joplin king of ragtime yeah and you know but after the whiz i really wanted to start making films that had something to do more personally with me yeah and i sadly left Motown and went to United Artists to direct A Small Circle of Friends, that somewhat autobiographical film. Wow. About and Goldman. you wrote that as well? No, Ezra Sachs oh, Ezra wrote Sachs. that. Got I, it. You know, who used to be a professor at NYU. Wow. And, uh, you know, and from there, you know, you, you struggle. You yeah. go up, you get a good review you get a terrible review you go to the next movie you get bad reviews you get a good review and then pretty soon i realized i wasn't getting enough steam to make it just as a director so i went back into producing again got it because i'd produced all those movies totally and then uh you know i started with legend of billy jean and and i was pushing the, the galleys of this book that nobody wanted and went around the whole town twice. Yeah. Everybody told me they thought it was the stupidest idea for a movie ever. What the and hell? it turned out to be The Witches of Eastwick. Wow. So, you know, I was flogging these kind of projects. Yeah. And then I was able to uh, make The Running Man and Ironweed and uh, Light of Day and Monster Squad. Wow. You know, one of the ones I'm most proud of because yeah. it was an iconic movie of the totally. 80s. But anyway, I made those, a lot of those in the 80s. And then, you know, I I was directing episodic television. I was directing the first year of Miami Vice, the first year of 30-something, you know, all Hooperman, totally. Year in the Life, all sorts of, of high-quality series, Private Eye, and... Uh, no, but this is back when, in, like, most of the content, which is ABC, NBC, CBS, yeah, it was right? All, it was all because now we live in a content bubble where, like, fucking, yeah, it, you know, Poland yeah. Springs has got a channel, of, you yeah, know, I know, <laughs> yeah, Rolling Rock. And so I'm curious. I'm curious to talk to you because, like, the '70s, you know, I think is probably the best decade for American cinema. And now we kind of live in a time where it's nothing but corporate properties That's that get true. made. That's true. What now, like, a lot of those movies that you made early in your career. Do you feel like they would have gotten made today? Hell no. Yeah. Hey, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which I did not make. Yeah. I'm not not trying to say I made these, but One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it would never get made today. I even feel like Forrest Gump uh, wouldn't get made today. Amadeus would not get made today. Forrest Gump wouldn't get made today. And The Godfather would probably not get (sighs) made today. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, because corporate, you know, they don't. Profit oh, reigns supreme. Gla- glamorizing yeah. gangsters, and, yeah. you know. So the, uh, they're also tied up in their silly political correctness that it's, you know, enough to make you puke. Yeah, it's really disgusting. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, though, you know, one of the things that I constantly talk about on this podcast is, you know, for actors, it's it's finding your voice. For musicians, it's finding your tone. And for directors, it's finding your style. Did you, you know, I know you had a lot of influences of directors you looked up to. What what was kind of were you did you feel like early on you had a style and it evolved or did you kind of figure figure it out as you went along? I knew that films for me are always too slow. Yeah. So I decided, even the early uh, uh, ventures I did in directing, 
when I looked at the films, I go, my God, it's so slow. It's so slow. You got to yeah. move it. You got to move it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And in episodic television like Miami Vice, where there was a lot of action, I was experimenting with really aggressively telling the story. Yeah. And, and not, no, no uh, shoe leather, no drive ups, no, you know, just get it going. Totally. Get to the scene, get yeah. to the core. And get to the next core, and get to the next core. And when I went back out and I wrote Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, I I started to put that pacing in. And um, and when after I did, you know, Dragon and then Dragonheart, yeah. which was a you know uh, Sean Connery, and, Dennis Quaid, iconic and, film, and the you know did the first CGI acting character and and, and, and Draco, can you talk to me dragon. about that because like i there's a great i actually think keanu reeves narrated it there's a great film that kind of talks about how the the cgi versus the uh, practical you know like jurassic park was one of the last movies that really utilized you know they all the dinosaurs were animatronic or practical and can you talk about early on what it was like, like with CGI versus the practical yeah well when i spielberg invited me to see jurassic Park one, yeah, and uh, we had been trying to do this script of Dragonheart, yeah, and another director had tried to do it with like a big Muppet, and it was awful. I mean, this just looked horrible the on the screen. screen test, yeah, was so awful, and because the producer Rafaela de, de Laurentiis and I had done Dragon, and she was the producer of Dragonheart, she gave it to me, and um, I read it. And I was going, I, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Right. Then we went to the screening of Jurassic, and I looked at that T Rex, you know, which was all CG. Yeah, that was the one of the few that was. Yeah. And I, I l turned to Rafi and said, "That's how we do it. Wow. We got to do that. Whatever that is, we got to do that and make it act." Yeah. <laughs> And was Lucas Hart's a thing at this time? You know, yeah, like yeah. It, it was. Oh, oh yeah, ILM was yeah. the major effects house. With a close second was Digital Domain. But other than those two behemoths, you know, the effects business was, you know, wow, in its real infancy as what it became. And Dragonheart was the bridging film. Yeah, because I took the technology of of this digital matrices and creating the model and the scan and and then actually animating it was and it was that green screen quaid was on or no, what no no almost no green screen wow we shot that was a part of my whole thing was no we're going to shoot in for the, real in these real locations yeah. no bullshit sets no green we're just going to put the dragon in these scenes. Yeah. And, of course, ILM was shitting a brick. <laughs> <laughs> they were gone. They yeah. were gone. No, no, you can't do it in the daylight. You can't put the dragon in the daylight. <laughs> I, I go, why not? And, he, and he, he, they go, because then we can't hide anything. <laughs> we have to hide in the night in shadows. <laughs> totally. And I said, not in this film. Yeah. In this film, we're going to do this dragon in every lighting situation. I'm going to have him swim. I'm going to have him swim underwater. He's going to fly. He's going to talk. He's going to act. He's going to tell jokes. Wow. And, and they thought I had lost my mind. And they came back with a, like $22 million for 188 shots. Oh, my God. And I storyboarded the entire movie many times trying to trim away – unnecessary you know fat totally and finally i got it down to 188 we went into production and you know because the truth is as i said to george lucas who i knew yeah um you know george somebody's gonna do it wait so with star wars was that what was that what was lucas doing in on those films was that was that cgi or was that oh yes yeah. yeah star wars was all cgi it was except for like the wookie who was in a suit Right, but what's it called when you use models? Is that uh, yeah? It was all miniature miniatures. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a very fine technology. Yeah. But what what George had discovered is that you know he could do more 
in the digital realm, but he was still struggling with the optical realm. Got with, it. You know, the Dijkstra cam and bipacked opticals and all of that stuff from the 70s. Yeah. And here we now were in 92 and uh, 93 with Jurassic in then I said to him, the next step's going to be to take the T-Rex and make it act. Yeah. So either you're going to do it or Digital Domain's going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Totally. And since you are the great revolutionary, you broke through how to do a creature. Yeah. Let's go together and figure out how to do a character. Wow. And, and was Sean on set during that movie? No, or? never on set. It was all, it was all dubbed in later? It, I, I did... Him, I recorded him three times, once in the Bahamas, once in Rome, and once in uh, L.A. And how was working with him, even though it was a... The greatest. Yeah, because that was like... The, he only did like three or four movies after that. I think, like, was it Tra Entrapment or... No, maybe The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen yeah, was like his well, last movie. That, well, he had a really bad experience on that. Yeah, I heard and, he was really unsatisfied. And, and he began to feel like, you know... He began to feel like Draco. He was like the last dinosaur, the last of the dragons. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't have those great, you know, John Huston and those kind right. of ch chums, yeah. you know, around him anymore. And he had me and Michael Bay and, you know, we were a different kettle of fish yeah i mean you you and bay really kind of started i mean now it's every movie's a 250 million dollar budget but you guys were some of the the earliest filmmakers to really kind of like prove that you could do those things so dragon heart was a huge success it was a monumental film of my childhood i imagine you had a lot of leverage after that to kind of decide what was what you wanted to do what was interesting to you after that well you know, somebody, John Davis, the producer John Davis, had given me the script of, of a, I, don't, I forget what it was called at the time, the script, but it was an intriguing story about an accident that collapses the Holland Tunnel here in New York wow. under the Hudson and an EMT, an emergency uh, technical guy who figures out a way to get in there to reach the people who are trapped. Wow. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, during 9-11, you saw a lot of the images that, yeah. were, that we did in, you know, uh, 95, wow. eight, uh, 1995, in this movie Daylight, where the, you see the first responders, yeah. and Stallone played the first responder who goes in. Wow. And he was a joy to work with, believe it or not. Yeah, but, yeah, I've heard but, many different things about it, him. You know what? Yeah. If you're smart with Sly, Sly smart with you. I if get If you're that. stupid with Sly, Sly can be really stupid with you. Yeah. But I think I, he and I had a connection that went all the way back to Rocky, and... Uh, uh, you know, where it's a long story. I yeah, won't tell you, but yeah. I, I, they wanted Billy D. Williams to play Apollo Creed. Wow! And Billy D. was under contract to us at Motown. Got it. So I got to read the script, and I tried to get Billy D. to do it. Yeah. But because it wasn't the lead, <laughs> and, and the lead was this guy nobody heard of. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. You know, um, Billy D didn't want to do it, and uh, so oh uh, yeah, that Star Wars and, cockiness, <laughs> and, and that that turned out to be not a good decision. Wow! But I met Sly during that period and was a great supporter of Rocky long before it came out. I kept telling people, "This film's gonna wipe out, you know, the whole box. I was gonna yeah. just rule this summer." And, you know, this guy, Stallone, I've seen, you know, John Avelson was a friend, the director, and he showed me some footage, and it's like, this guy is unbelievable. Yeah. You can't take your eyes off him. Totally. And he's something new. Yeah. You've never seen an actor this physical. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and from the street and from, you know, the corner and Italian, and it was just an amazing time. So Cy and I... We had a 110-day shoot. Wow. It was a long one. 
And we made that film, which was also very successful. Yeah, it was. I, I'm curious because, like, in the '90s, we kind of start getting in that that analog to to digital transition. What was that like for you as a filmmaker? I mean, I know Reds weren't quite yet a thing or things like that, but was that a tricky? No, Wait, what? I, I am. Since I had done Dragonheart, and since I knew what digital filmmaking was basically about, yeah. I was an early converter. Oh, you were? Wow, okay. I mean, the, the first digital editing suite, I threw away the moviola and all the stupid racks and all the goddamn guillotine splicers. <laughs> and, and, I mean, yeah. there's nothing so absurd, and this would happen all the time, Yeah, where you're getting ready for a screening at the studio, Yeah, and you're, like, connect re-taping some area of the film yeah. with tape splices. Totally. And you find out that you're missing two sprocket holes on of a piece of of a frame. Wow. And you got everybody in the editing room with flashlights on their knees trying to find where that thing, yeah. that trim disappeared to. Got it. And you look around at that and you go, hey, we don't need any of this plastic crap. We yeah. just have to have numbers. Yeah. And numbers don't disappear. Wow. So so I started with the digital editing, and then when the cameras, at first the cameras were... Because it was all Panavision for a long time. They kind of had a market threshold on, on Hollywood, right? Yeah, well, Pan... You know, Bob Gottschalk and that whole operation had done so much research and development and had brought cameras, systems so far from yeah. where they were in the Mitchell BNC days that that they had they had they earned their place yeah but like often in history the the upstart becomes the status quo yeah and the status quo resists change yeah and they were experimenting with digital but then there were the independent companies um like red yeah that was going a whole other direction right and then finally you know um the alexa yeah you know came Ari. along yeah from Ari, yeah, from Ari. Ariflex, yeah. and uh you know those germans are very clever <laughs> yeah they <That's> are <laughs> <laughs> and and then i'm curious you know did skulls come first or did fast come first skulls skulls Talk to me about that film. You know, uh, was that so much of uh, looking back to your time at a Ivy League institution and knowing well, of the? Well, it was a script um, that had been written uh, that Neil Moritz owned, and we had just done the Rat Pack for HBO with Ray Liotta. Yeah, and that's Don right. Cheadle, you did do the yeah, which is actually one of my favorite things I ever did because yeah. it's uh, one of the chances where I really got to do a movie really strictly about performance. Yeah. You know, and Cheadle won every single award yeah. that an actor could win for that film. Wow. And uh, uh, at any rate, he gave me, Neil gave me the skulls, and I read it, and I went, well, I know all about this. It's a pretty good little thriller. Yeah. So, yeah, to do a high uh, college thriller around secret societies is a really cool idea. Yeah. John Pogue had written, I just Got remembered his name, John Pogue. And he had a really cool thing about a townie who had gotten into Yale, you know, this guy from the wrong side of the tracks yeah. in New Haven who'd gotten into the school and... Was of working to survive, kind and, of more blue collar. Right, yeah, and yeah. amidst trust funders and, yeah. you know, people on the free ride. Yeah. And... Uh, that was your first film with Paul Walker, right? Yeah. How can you... Talk a little bit about you. Well, how you, know, you guys met? Yeah, we met th in Mary Vernou's casting office wow. in Venice. And, you know, he came in and we were looking for, you know, this, pretty this Ivy League wa waspy guy. Yeah. And he came in and, you know, he was he was like a surfer. Yeah. He was like, hey, dude. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and, he slurred all his words. Everything was slang and all this <laughs> stuff. And that was like right after Pleasantville, right? Like shortly, because he he had a younger career and then it kind of didn't work out for a while. Yeah. And he I came, think it was right after Varsity Blues. Varsity Blues, yeah. And, you know, after talking to him for about 15 minutes, I said, I'll tell you what. 
here's what we got to do. Because I, you have something. I knew it right away. I said, you have something. But I want you to go away for a week. And I want you to relearn this part. And I want you to enunciate every single syllable of every single word. Yeah. You are a chote educated person from a very sophisticated and educated household yeah. going way back in American history. Generational Generation, wealth. Generation. Oh, yeah. You're a legacy yeah. at yeah. Yale. Yeah. yeah. You got to talk like a ye- legacy at Yale. Yeah. You can't be a surfer yeah. and play this part. So I called up an acting teacher I knew, and I asked her to work with him, to just get him to talk like this instead of, hey, me, you know. How you doing? Yeah. You know, Hi, hey, hey. Yeah. <clears throat> That's amazing. And, what- and he came back and in a week. And he did the part again, and I went over to him and hugged him and go, you got the part. You did it. You wow. changed. And that was the start of such a warm and lovely, loving relationship between him and me. Yeah. And, you know, it ended where it ended, but we made the skulls, and then... I was so happy with what he did in the skulls. Yeah, and Joshua he, Jackson. Yeah, he was he, great. He was yeah. going head yeah. to head with Josh Jackson. Yeah, and that's and not Josh easy. was crushing it in the nineties. Yeah, mean, god damn, no one worked like Josh. No. Yeah, but he was that a fun experience making yeah, that it was movie. Really fun. Did I imagine probably Yale didn't let you shoot there? No. <laughs> No, they <laughs> yeah. declined. Also, like I, I, you know, something that's so important to me in films, and I'm sure they are to you as well, is mood and atmosphere. And one of the favorite things I love about the skulls is that score. You know, that score yeah, is Randy incredible. Edelman. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Talk to me about you know, as a filmmaker, well, establishing mood and atmosphere for you. You know, where where did that? Well, did well you... it's got to come from everywhere. Yeah, you can't have one mood on the screen and one mood in the soundtrack. You, I mean, you can do anything, but that never seems to synthesize. Yeah, and what was Sam? She, he, she is Sam Rockwell's wife. What's her name again? The actress, uh, Leslie Bibb. Leslie Bibb, love Leslie. Lovely, yeah, lovely, yeah. And you know, I have done a lot of my movies with Randy Edelman as the composer because we have this relationship. He he did Dragon, the Bruce Lee sco- yeah. story, which that score was used in the Olympics, oh, you know, wow. Elvis Stoiko, the guy s- skated to get his silver medal uh, to that music from Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Um, the music from Dragonheart yeah. is universal. Uh, and the skulls with that haunting piano arpeggio. Yeah. You oh. know, Randy hits it and he gets an emotional connection between the film and the audience or yeah. the listener, and you feel that the film has expanded yeah. because of it. Yeah, that was such a home run. I, I love that score. I, I still listen to it on YouTube sometimes, you know, and I'm in, like, that dark brooding mood. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was in Hawaii uh, in Maui where I had a home to take drugs and have sex, and, and, as uh, we all need uh, to. Uh, <laughs> as we need to. And, uh, Where's the rock and roll at? <laughs> oh, that came. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I was there, and it was Christmas time. And one day I was walking down the street in Paella, and there's Paul. No way. Oh, yeah, he was a huge surfer. And, yeah. like, he avenged, and gotten sea life creatures and yeah. conservation. And, and he was in Maui surfing. And I said to him, like, what are you doing tonight? Let's go to dinner. Yeah. So we went to Mama's Fish House. And over the dinner, he said, what are you working on? I said, well, I don't have anything that's really close to the line. Yeah. I have a lot of things in development. But there's one I'm absolutely certain that you should have the lead. And he goes, what's that? I said, well... It's this thing set in this kind of street racing world. Yeah, what was the first title of it again? It was like... Uh, it, w- it was like Red Line. Red Line, that was it, time. Red Line, yeah. Ah, very different. <laughs> anyway, 
red line. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because like... So, I... so hold on. Let me tell you okay. this part because this was really cool about us, Paul and Matt. So, so I said, you know, he says, so street racing. He said, do I get a fast car? I said, you get a couple of them. <laughs> and he says, well, what am I? What's my character? I said, right, look, as of now, you're an undercover cop who's in there to bust some hijackers who may or may not be part of this street racing world. And he goes, oh, that's cool. So I'm a cop. Do I get a gun? I said, of course you get a gun. Yeah. You know, it's a film of mine. <laughs> you get a fast car and a gun, right? And when you walk through the door, he, he and do I have a love interest or do I get a girl? Or I said, well, that's the cool gimmick. You fall in love with the sister yeah. of the guy who may or may not be the hijacker. And I said, I'm going to tell you right now, we stole the whole plot from Point Break. Yeah. <laughs> right? Great artist steal, uh, man. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It, you know, yeah. so... And, you know, and he said, and you're directing. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm in. I said, well, Paul, there's not even a script. It's an outline. It's yeah. He goes, listen, I get a fast car. I get the girl. I got a gun. And you're directing. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> so I called Universal uh, when they were open for business after the holiday. I said, we've landed Paul Walker for Redline. And he was one of the biggest at that time, so I'm well, sure he that... was coming up yeah. fast. Yeah, you know? so they were all happy, and uh, they greenlit it on that. No, oh no, we had to get the script. <laughs> <laughs> we're casting with no script, really. Yeah. So we got the script, and then it became who goes with Paul. Wow. Who? What's the coloration? What's yeah. the tonality? What's the seasoning that will go with Paul? Of the quote an antagonist if you will or you know pro it, yeah the yeah, other yeah, hero, yeah, the yeah. other hero anti -hero. Yeah, yeah yeah they're yeah. both anti-heroes totally, right? totally yeah so so you know colin farrell came in yeah because he had daredevil then right and, he just was fresh off the boat from ireland and, and you know i loved him and but colin farrell and paul walker it's a little more like too much like spin and marty you yeah know? it's too very good looking man. Yeah, too. Yeah. And this, you're losing the street world. Yeah. And, so, and then one day I saw uh, Pitch Black. And I saw this big, hulking, mixed race guy. Yeah. And I went, What's his name? Is his name really Vin Diesel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, Yeah. Well, he's, he's the right kind of guy. Yeah. You know, because my research that I had been able to do by this point. You know, these are all very ethnic. You know, it's Asian. Well, yeah, it's like... It's Hispanics, it's whites, it's blacks. It's very multiculti. Yeah. And you got to reflect that world. So here's a guy who reflects it just in his persona. Yeah. So I met with him and... We're saving Private Ryan out at this point. He had done it, that. Yeah. But I call Stephen and... So what'd you think of Vin Diesel? Big pause. And he goes, there's a reason I killed him off first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Cocky motherfucker. Well, so he was telling Stephen how to direct. Oh, you know, Jesus Christ. Giving him a helpful hint. What, what made him so cocky? Was it multifacial? Like, what? Or just that delusional self-belief that actors have. He's, yeah. he's a guy, if you believe... The kind of uh, almost mystical line of it. There are certain people that know they are movie stars. Yeah. Now, for everyone that knows it and becomes it, you have 250,000 that knew it and are now box boys at Ralph's. Yeah. Right? But in the case of Vin and a, a few others that I have known, um, like Sly, uh, and Arnold, yeah, you know when I did the Running Man, you know these guys knew. Yeah. Arnold knew first he was going to make his own body pumping into what iron, he wanted yeah. to, and then he was going to become an actor. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, look, they offered Sly a million dollars to buy the Rocky script from him. Yeah, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't sell. Yeah, he was. I'm the star, or fuck off. Yeah, right. So. Uh, at any rate, Vin was one of those self-determined movie stars. 
So when I met with him, I knew that I couldn't have that attitude. Yeah. I, I did not want to work with that attitude. Yeah, it's not. So we met at the Four Seasons for drinks. And when I sat down, I go, this is probably going to be a very short meeting. I'm only going to ask you one question, and I want to see what you answer. Yeah. And he was already rattled. Oh, I love it. Because he was used to people. Yeah, going, mother. Please do my movie, <laughs> baby. <laughs> you know. And yeah. I was like, no, man. Yeah. So tell me, answer me this. Why does every director I've spoken to that you work with tell me that you're a pain in the ass? Yeah. And he said, ooh. And I said, well, just start with everybody. Yeah. Right? You don't need names. Trust me, I did my research. And then what was interesting is he started explaining the difficulties from his point of view on the Frankenheimer movie, on this movie, yeah. on that movie. And, and I said, good. Well, here's the script. Read it. Give me an answer by tomorrow. End of business. Wow. And... Uh, he read it, and his lawyer called and said he loves it, and he wants to be Dominic Toretto, and, uh, which meant nothing at that time. Yeah. And uh, so I get him, gave him this RX-7 because I wanted the image of a big, big guy in a small car. In a small <laughs> car. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we went, we went off and did this movie. The studio... Universal did not give a shit about the movie. The producer didn't give a shit about the movie. Nobody cared. Did you work on the script yourself yeah. as a writer? I wrote scenes. Got that it. Are in Wait, the was film. the quarter mile line yours? No, that, <laughs> that was David Ayer. Wow, David Ayer. Wow, I love David Ayer. Yeah, me yeah. Too. yeah. That was one of the scenes left over from his original script. -y. Well, I want to take a moment and say it fucking here because I don't think it's said enough. Rob Cohen, you were responsible for changing the future of cinema. And that movie was so ahead of its time. You know, now in 2020, especially what you just spoke about with diversity and you were the first to really do Thank that, you. man. Thank and you. you don't get the fucking credit, the justice. You created one of the most iconic franchises of all time and I'm fucking tired of all those other motherfuckers that came after you getting the credit for that. That is yours. Well, you did you. that, man. And you're one of the like, you are one of the greatest directors of all time. And I'm I'm so curious. While you were on that set, you know, I don't know. I'm a big Oasis and Beatles guy, and I, I read a lot of interviews with Paul and Noel Gallagher, and you know, they obviously they wrote some of the most famous songs of all time. And one of the interviewers was like, you know, when you were writing that song, did you know, Hey Jude, or you know. Uh, don't look back on anger. Did you know that it was just? And they're like, of course I didn't fucking know. If if I would have known, I would have needed Xanax. You know, like <laughs> when, when you were on that movie, did did you know? No, I knew we were doing something special. I knew because everything, you know, when you come up with a shot which goes down from Vin down through his arm through the stick shift into the wankle engine yeah. out to the boost of the wheels, when you're freeing the camera to do whatever you want it to do. You're yeah. not looking at logic. You're not looking at it even being technically possible. Yeah. You're just doing it. Totally. And because, why? Because it's fucking cool, that's why. Because it's a, a way of showing the close connection between these drivers and their automobiles, because I was always saying they're centaurs. How, how did they're, you get involved with the race? Did you have an idea? Was there like a racing subculture in Los Angeles? Did you kind of follow some? No, it was uh, Kevin Misher, an executive at Universal. Had a, a, he had purchased a, a, an article from Vibe magazine wow. about street racing. And it, it, they had a script that was not something I thought captured the reality. Yeah. I think in that first script, uh, you know, he was. it was like he was t Dominic, who became Dominic, yeah. was torn between playing the violin and being a street racer. What? It was, <laughs> yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah. Crazy. So at any rate, we, um, it, it started with the Vibe magazine article, and then David Ayer and I went into it and started to find the streetiness of it. Yeah. Because I had read his script, Training Day. Yeah, God. And I thought it was genius. Oh. And I was really very happy to work with him. He's a very smart and very good guy. And we got that first vision 
onto the page. He and I used to go to these, like, you know, parts conventions wow. where all these kids and and he and i would like run around the room sneaking around and you'd hear some kid going yeah well i got that hmk oh intercooler and you know, <laughs> hmk intercooler and my sparko seat you know and you know, sparko seat I, I i wish you would have bought one of those companies because i got to say my fucking high school dude everyone got a spoiler a body kit like a nos sticker it was like oh my god the fart pipe you know? jesus <laughs> Yeah, I would have made more money <laughs> if, I, if I, I should have invested in Sparko yeah. and I would have been all right. But at any rate, what I knew was we were doing things differently. Yeah, I was doing this at a pace that was breakneck in terms of the rhythms and in the racing and chasing and action sequences. And uh, um, I just felt like since the studio was staying away, why don't we just do whatever the hell we think yeah. we should do? And the cast and crew and I were in a real mind meld how to tell this story up from the roots of the street itself. And, um, you know, we shot all on the streets of... Well, and that's one of the things that I love about that film so much is because it, 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 at least it looks, and I could be wrong, but it looks like so much of that is, is real practical stunts, you know, when that... When that car goes underneath the semi truck, yeah, it's real. that was real. It's a trick, yeah, as everybody knows now. <laughs> but the first time you see it, it's you go, insane. Whoa. And then you know, with uh, what's that guy that plays Vince? You know, on on the truck on the outside, yeah. and that like, was all done. for It real. was so incredible to see that. I mean, I, I I feel like Michael Bay and all those directors that you know kind of started to take off after that film just stole from you. You know, well, it's you know, there's so many ideas in the ether and yeah. all of us access them different ways. You know, Bay is a wonderfully, you know, talented technical genius. He can whip up action scenes like nobody. Uh, yeah. And uh, he usually has the budget to do these dreams. What, was the budget on that first one without giving numbers? Was it as high as what we're hearing it is on some of these other ones? No, oh. it was $38 million. Wow. Now they're 350 Yeah, because there's a fucking submarine in Iceland coming. Like, it, What is it like now? Because like a lot of those films, I feel like that first film so monumental, and it's such a great story, and the characters are amazing. But then... They just started to become parodies of themselves. Well, you know, in my film, the first one, the original one, as I like to call it, um, we demonstrated the way this group of disparate people interacted as a family. Yeah. We showed it. We didn't speak it. Yeah. Now, Vin looks at the camera and goes, I don't have friends. I have family. Oh, God. Right. Ugh. So you're getting a guy who went from portraying his paternal position yeah. to speaking his label. Yeah. And that's what I find with all these Justin Lin and yeah. different things. It's a, it's like... Hob Shaw? Like, what is... It's just so weird, I don't man. Know. I don't know. Yeah. Not, but uh, we, they do huge business, which... You know, and what I resent, of course, is when these motherfuckers, people, in my quote, my yeah, words, not yours, <laughs> you know, where they they claim credit. Yeah, there. It's my cast. It is yours. It's the clothes I put them in. Yeah, it's the cars I put them in. It's the shots I created. Yeah, and the attitude. And what they can't recapture is the purity of that attitude, because we were making it without knowing where it was going to go. Yeah. But we knew we were in it as a family together. Yeah. And those, those, the outcome was so unexpected. I mean, so beyond even my wildest, like... You mean the box office? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, go jerk off in the bathroom fantasies. Yeah. It was like, you're going to, you are creating the foundation of a, I don't know how much it is up to six billion dollar franchise. I think it's more than that now. I don't I mean, I, with the international it, markets. It probably who knows. All I know is we just wanted to make it good. Yeah, and so you we, did, and we did, and then we had the good luck of timing. Um, when Neil 
bought the title The Fast and the Furious from Roger Corman, or Universal bought the title. We had a unique kind of thing. Did you know when you heard the name, you're like, that, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, I had to wrap my mind around it. I'm, I didn't just jump on it. But of I'm, course. But, you know, because then I started thinking, yeah, we have made a kind of updated Corman film. Yeah. It's a modern Roger Corman film. Wow. And, uh, and that's when I adapted it and felt, gave the permission. And, uh, and we happened to have really good luck with the marketing team of yeah. Mark Schmugger and Adam Fogelson, who were in their zone as marketers with yeah. this particular film. They saw it, and they knew what to do with it, and that's when they moved it from spring break, because that's all it was supposed to be is a two-week flusher at spring break, into the summer wow. between tomb raider and ai wow and when they told me that's where they were positioning it i you knew they I, knew that well i knew, yeah i thought i was going to be run over by like oh you did it oh wow because you know you make a 38 million dollar movie with yeah. nobody in it and you got to remember that year jerry Bruckheimer had made gone in 60 seconds right sly had done uh uh what was it called it, not speed it was called uh I, I didn't know but, what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And everywhere I went that year, and they go, Rob, what are you working on? I go, I'm doing this car movie about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go, you do know Jerry is making Gone in 60 <laughs> seconds. You know? And I said, yeah, I know, but that's different. Yeah. I'm, do I'm doing something completely different. And it was. Oh, Sly's movie was Driven. Driven, Driven. Yeah. 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 And I said, we're doing something different. Yeah. Yeah, but they have movie stars and you have nobody. Why? Paul Walker was huge. Well, yeah. you're you're talking Hollywood. Yeah, where yeah, a, yeah. A, a, Paul was not on the A-list. He was on all us young people's Got it. Well, I wasn't as young as no, you, you guys were. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he was on my A-list. And always will be. Yeah. And, uh, and and that was one of the most beautiful things. I, I, I highly recommend anyone that hasn't seen it about the documentary I Am Paul Walker was, you know, there's this, uh, a scene of him talking about how he worked with you on Skulls. And that was one of the best experiences of his life. And then he has this beautiful moment of like, you know, when they asked about that, they're like, I just wanted to work with Rob again. I just knew I wanted to do whatever it is he was doing next. Yeah. And I just thought that was such a beautiful and poignant moment. And you know when when it came out and became the success it was what, you know how did it, how did that change your life you know where you, i well, mean well i'll never forget this day you know uh we had done the junket you know where the press had yeah. come in and i had prepared all the actors i said look you know you know these people are squares yeah you're right these are not progressive people all these journalists think they're the like the hippest you know but they're really not. And so don't be upset if we don't sweep yeah. good word yeah. from the writers. Right. But I'll tell you where we're going to sweep is the streets. Yeah. And we're going to clean up out there. So you guys, this is the last Friday that you're going to be the same as you've been. Come next Friday when this thing opens, it's going to change all our lives wow. and that I know in my heart and and you know next Friday it it blew the doors yeah. out I mean it was a smash hit I mean yeah. I I had friends of mine in high school that saw it five six seven times you know well you know it was a wonderful wonderful Cinderella story and and when you have that kind of monumental hit what what influences you on on your next decision you know well you know I I wanted to work with Vin and Paul again. Yeah. And uh, Joe Roth at the company called Revolution came to me with an, a script that was by Rich Wilkes, which was still very unformed. Yeah. But it had one great idea in it, a punk James Bond. Yeah. And I went, you know what? John Calley and all these major producers in Hollywood have been trying to do an American James Bond since the first James Bond. Totally. And they've failed at everything they've tried. Yeah. And you know why they failed? Because they don't, they try to portray James Bond as a sophisticated American. Yeah. We want a tattooed, vile 
extreme sports guy. Yeah. Right? And from that, Rich and I went to work, and we reshaped the script to be Triple, triple X. X. Yeah. And you, and you knew you wanted to work with Vin for that role? The, the, well, you know, I, I gave it to Vin, and, uh, you know, he had made a million and a quarter on Fast yeah. in terms of his fee. And Paul had made a million. Yeah. And uh, Vin said to me, yeah, I'll do it for $10 million. Oh, my God. And, and I went, nobody's going to pay you $10 million, yeah. Vin, that you don't go in this town from a million and a quarter to 10 yeah, you're not because of one hit, right? Big as it is. Yeah. Uh, I'll do it for 10 and not a penny less, right? So... You know, I told Joe Roth in the studio that. And he went, well, who else is there? Like studios did. Yeah. I said, well, um, you know, I'll I'll try. There's Eric, this guy, Eric Banna from Australia. There's this one. There's that one. And I went around meeting some of these guys. and had some very good meetings. Like, I love meeting Eric Banna. Yeah. Love meeting uh, Guy Pierce and some of the new people who are coming up and uh, uh, but either they didn't want to do it they didn't understand yeah. it exactly or they weren't really right so I finally had a lunch with Joe Roth again and I said look all these people they're not right there's yeah. only one actor in the whole fucking world who's right for this part and it's Ben Diesel Yeah. so the choice is pay him ten. make triple X <laughs> and pay him ten yeah. or all of us go home. Yeah. And I never forget Joe, who's a great producer and a great studio, been a great studio executive. And he looked and he went, God damn it. He goes, I guess I'm going to have to pay him $10 million Oh, my God. Because I want the movie. But I want the movie by August next year. Wow. And this was already, it, it was like August the year before yeah you know and uh because i remember the first day of pre-production was september 11th 2001 no way you know and what was it like on set that day when you well, guys got the it, new we it, this we were still in the offices in oh the okay okay got it got but it. i i remember going in and telling everybody to go home you know that we we could start the next day that this was not a day to start working on a film and and because of having that success of fast and so many big sequences when you were working on that script i mean there's three of the coolest action scenes i have ever seen in my life and you actually invented a shot that a camera company kind of built later the gopro you know that that corvette shot off that bridge yeah no shot like that had ever existed no, before in no. the car how, how did you, how did you, and I'm also thinking of the, of the dirt bike scene of the, over the cartel ranch yeah, and, and that, then the, that uh, whole sequence. that whole, I mean, the, oh, jumping over a barn. We did that in I, camera did, with the Huey helicopter shooting the Vulcan cannons. Oh my God. All those casings streaming down from the helicopter. Those are all real, you know, copper brass casings from, wow. and we got a real uh, Twitch Stenberg, a real X Games jumper to jump over the roof, and we blew it up right under his ass. And and he did it. He, I, and he did it. I mean, that, that take is nuts. That's like one of the biggest and greatest action moments I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, and all the no, no oh, CG, CG. No, no, it was all in camera. Yeah, I remember watching the special features when I bought that DVD as a kid being like, this is insane. You know, and we loaded it up the night before wow. to try to get the shot. And it took so long because I was working with between 15 and 18 cameras on these big stunts yeah. because, man, you only get you one only shot. Yeah. To do it yeah. Once. And setting those cameras up with Dean Semler, a brilliant cinematographer, we would go around and we would set them up and then we'd look at the lens. We'd switch it. Okay. Change this to a 75, put the 50 over there, do this, do that. And by the time we got it rigged and the explosives were loaded, the sun was tipping the horizon and the sky where the jumper was going to come 
was no longer black. No way. It was beginning to lighten. And every, you know, you know, the producing part was telling me, pull it, call action, do yeah. it, do it. And, and I'm going, uh, they're, they're not even quite ready. And look at the sky. It's not right. It's not right. <coughs> and, and finally, I just went rap. Wow. Because it wasn't right. And this was one you did not want to fuck up. You know, so we came back the next night. And you got it, it the next night. Got it. Wow. Well, and it was one and done on that? One and done. Wow. Six, 15 cameras, something like that. Wow. What an iconic moment, yeah. man. And was that a great time filming that movie? Oh, I mean, you, so you guys good. got to travel around the world, right? So good. Yeah. It was so good. And that's another one that kind of inadvertently turned into a franchise. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It, unfortunately, it. It, it it has been done in fits and starts. Yeah. You know, I wanted to do the sequel. The, the Ice Cube one? or No, oh. I wanted to do the sequel with Vin. Yeah. And Joe Roth was in that thing. Like, he didn't trust Vin, and he was worried about... He goes, that guy could do anything. Yeah. And ruin the movie before it's even released. Yeah. And, and I said, well, you know, he is triple X. And they went, no, we have a great idea. <laughs> oh, reboot with Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> they called me with this. They go, we have a genius idea, says Todd Garner, that genius of men. And he goes, Ice Cube. Yeah. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Okay, that's funny, Todd. You Smile got, your letter. You got yeah, me. Yeah. All right, who do you have in mind? <laughs> 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 he goes, Ice Cube. Oh, my God. I go, what? I love Ice Cube. Yeah. But you can't put him in a black action suit with that tummy. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? It's like, really, yeah. you just can't. You can't do this. Yeah. You cannot do this. Yeah. And they went, no, we've already made the deal with him. And I'm oh, going, I'm I out. Went, I went, go with God. Yeah. And, and, what, and how do you, you know, when you have that kind of success, and I'm sure, you know, that would add maybe a couple more zeros to your bank account doing it. How do you know to stay, just because you're such a great director, just creativity reigns supreme for you, you know? I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't, well, I'm really happy I didn't do Me too. Triple X 2. And, uh, but, you know, when you look back at Fast... You know, the problem was right from that sequel, you know, I got the script. Vin and I got the script. We were in Bora Bora finishing Triple X. Yeah. And we got the script and set in the Florida Keys. Yeah. You know, racing laundered money in these unobtrusive Mandarin orange and chartreuse cars. Yeah. You know, what? It's yeah. just make no, no sense. Yeah. So... He didn't want to do it, right? Ben then, didn't want to do yeah. it. And then I went, you know what? If he doesn't want to do it, I say, I'm not going to do it. We'll have the leverage to make him throw that script away and rewrite something that stays in L.A. Totally. my idea was the sequel should always start right where the, it left off. It left off. Yeah. Paul's facing the cops. Yeah. Ben's got a broken arm. He's on the run. Yeah. In Paul's car. Start right there. Yeah. Let's... Pick it up. We, yeah. Weave that yarn. And, um, you know, and I got this call from Neil Moritz and Scott Stuber, and they said, no, we're shooting this script with you or without you. Without Vin or with Vin, we're going into production on this script. Wow. I go, you know the script sucks. Yeah. Do you have any idea? We don't think it sucks. We think it's really commercial. And I said to Vinny, if you're not doing it, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Because I, this is like selling out what we did. Yeah. And they got John Singleton. Yeah. Uh, Rest in peace. Him, you yeah. Know, lovely guy. And yeah. Good director. And he did it. And, you know, it, it, it sucked. It did okay. <laughs> but you know where it did? It did better foreign than mine. Yeah. Because mine, when it came out, Europeans all around the world are going, what? They what didn't get this? the American what culture, yeah. But by the time Fast hit DVD, and it sold 14 million DVDs, God. It, at the time it got all over the world, people were seeing it, and kids were finding it. And they were going, whoa, this is great. Yeah. So when the sequel came out, it did less well, I think, domestically, but it did better foreign, because suddenly, all over the world, young 
guys Chinese, and gals who Russians. are interested in cars yeah. and speed and what, or just the hipness of it. Um, they had found it, and uh, and then as if they didn't learn their lesson enough. They did the third one. Oh my God! With nobody from the yeah. original. Yeah, yeah, God. And it was only when they had that cameo of Vin and the Charger the end. at the end yeah. that Universal realized that what I had told them from several day years one. before is go back with the original cast and so on. But they didn't come back to me. They went to Justin, Justin Lin. Fuck that guy. Well, um, uh, after that, you know, you, you did Mommy, Alex Cross, the boy was. The boy girl next, next boy, boy next, next door. Yeah. And, you know, the boy next door was a huge hit. So were the other ones. Uh, but now as we're kind of moving into, as we were speaking about earlier, you know, nothing but, but Marvel properties and DC, you know, what what is interesting to you as a filmmaker? I imagine you're, you're getting a lot of different things coming your way. What, where do you, I mean, I hate to say this and sound so existential, but, but do you feel like cinema's dead? Is it, is it no. over? No, it's not dead. It's just harder to get it made. Yeah. Because the vision is, uh, you know, big IP, YA novels, titles, yeah. that have na- and remakes and sequels. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's the card that is being dealt. Yeah. Um, but in all different ways, with independent money and so on, which is a very hard route, which I do not enjoy. Yeah. But I can't get these films made any other way. Totally. So, you know, I've been... The, the Hurricane Heist you got made totally with foreign money. Yeah, yeah wow. Uh, independent. You know, Mark Damon and Moshe Diamant, the two producers, raised the money. Yeah. From Great Quantas. film. I, I love Ryan Quantin, you know. Yeah, he Quantus. He was... <laughs> Ryan Quantin, it was... I call him Quantus. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I actually yeah. think he's going to do the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the yeah. nicest guy. Yeah. I love him. He's a really good actor, too. Yeah. But, you know, Toby and Ryan and, you know, um, they all were wonderful to work with. Yeah. So, but... Uh, well, what, what's but, on your but, plate? But, on, but you, we never had enough money for visual effects. In, in Hurricane Ice? Yeah. So, you know, I could have done that so much better yeah. with another $6 million. Yeah. But when you're doing indie financing, you get a limit. And no matter what you do, you, you from that point on, you're just begging for favors. Yeah, I get you know, that. You know, so that was a $28 million movie. But it looks like a $120 million yeah. movie. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But the effects could have been better. Well, you know, man, I, I thought it was beautiful, and I really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm curious, so what, what, can you talk about what's next, what you have in the works? I got a few things in the works. Uh, uh one is a project I'm producing with Keanu Reeves. Amazing. Called uh, Recharge that was written by a young director, Todd Grossman. Okay. And we are close to getting that deal done and financed. It's been, a, you know, unfortunately one of the producers was in a near-fatal auto accident. Oh, my God. And he's the bridge between us and the money. And Got it. He's been in the hospital for months. Oh, so hopefully that's coming together uh, with Moshe Diamant um, and Avi Lerner at Millennium. I did a, I redeveloped um, uh, the movie Unlawful Entry. Okay. That starred R- Ray Liotta. Yeah. Well, I've switched it so the cop is a woman and a lesbian, and her fixation is not on the husband, is on the wife. Love that. And so it's it's trying to bring that story into a kind of you know current scene yeah but it's it's such a good thriller because these cops have so much power and if they choose to use that power on you in a in a bad wrong way, way it, yeah it can be very tense and 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 you've had a marco polo script in development for some time right yeah you know that went a long way with paramount and the china film group but along came Donald Trump, oh, God. and along came his stupid tariffs, and along came the resentment from China yeah. that canceled all American co-productions. Wow. So we'll see where that goes if we ever get rid of Trump, which I pray we will. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob Cohen, I, two final questions, man. I, I could talk to you for hours, but I know we got to go to dinner, which I'm excited about. But, uh, you know, for, for the young filmmakers out there that, you know, did 
grow up in a place like Cornwall and, and they really want to get in the business. Any any words of advice, you know, if if you were starting today, 18-year-old you know, Rob, what would you say? Well, I'd still say skip film school. Yeah. Because I really believe that's a very expensive waste of time. Yeah. You're much better off. You're much better off being a reporter for a blog. Yeah. Or a web website or... And, you know, or a newspaper, magazine, whatever you can get. Get out and meet life. Yeah. Learn who people are. Study characters. Absorb yourself in all the possibilities and all the f- millions of stories that come by your, your, your life if you're out looking. Yeah. As, you know, and you can do this when you're out in Hollywood. You can knock on doors. You can... Do PA work. You can yeah. do all that stuff, and it's all valid. Yeah. But where most people, I find, don't get it is they lose that grounding in real life where real stories and real characters emanate. Yeah. Because in film school, you're taught, like, well, this was the character as it yeah. was played in Casablanca. Totally. And this all those stock characters. You know, yeah. And you just are taught what, you know, John Ford did, yeah. uh, you know, and that's all great. But you don't, you can buy a book on John Ford. You can yeah. buy 10 books on John Ford. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to sit there and pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year in tuition. God, buy a Lamborghini you pretty know. much. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, there are new guys coming up like the Safty brothers yeah. and so on that are just rewriting the rules in their own way. Yeah. I love those guys from afar. I've never met them. I'd love to meet them. Yeah. But they they they're doing it the way they want to do it. Yeah. And they got a major movie star to play that part and they got a major distribution. It's not a movie a studio would have made. Yeah. If you went to Universal and you said to them, I want to make a movie with this crazy Jew yeah. guy. Yeah, Diamond and, District. And Diamond District. Yeah. Hasidic Jews and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, an uncut stone, <laughs> big basketball <laughs> player. You know, yeah. they go, yeah, okay. And the minute you left the office, they go, don't let me ever see <laughs> those assholes again. Right? Yeah. They don't get it. Yeah. Right? But getting it your own way outside the system is the way to go yeah and uh, i love that you know and you you see once in a while a film like 1917 or inception yeah will get made through the cracks but those are people who did four studio hits and they, and they earn that you know yeah. that that and, that right to make whatever and i'm sure sam mendes didn't have an easy time getting yeah. 1917 yeah made. i mean even scorsese had to go to netflix for the irishman i know yeah so once in a while through the system, original work will get done, but it's not going to be easy. Yeah, streaming is the new world, and you know if you're a minority director, a woman, or you know a, POC, you know <laughs> that's a very fertile field because yeah. they want for the, all the episodes they're turning to trying to get the diversity and balance things out and it is a long been overdue yeah but you know so you could look into that arena but the the way to get anywhere the fastest you can get there is the power of 110 good pages wow writing writing I would do study writing, screenplay, uh, drama. Even yeah. not, not even yeah. you don't even have to study screenwriting. Yeah, study writing. Yeah, literature even. Learn like, yeah. how words are put together, how stories are told, how sentences are formed, and how dialogue can play. Yeah, you know you'll learn more. You know from, you know, r- reading plays, starting with Shakespeare on up. Um, or on down, yeah. Right? <laughs> but you 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 will learn more about the human heart and how it expresses itself through plays, yeah. Because their dialogue is basically their only main tool, totally. Right? For you know, they have sets. They have you know. Today we have all sorts of visual stunning effects on stage, but but basically it's about people talking and exploring their situation while you're watching yeah and so writing 
you know, it's like when I found the sting, David S. Ward, no one knew who he was. Yeah. The day after it got sold to Universal and had yeah, George five Ray Hill and deal. Newman and Redford, yeah. <laughs> David S. Ward was not um, unemployed for the next so it, 15 it, years. It can happen when you, when you do the good work. If you do the good work, good things come. Yes. And if you do the good work and you do a short, that's one way to do it. Yeah. But writing is the cheapest way because no one has to give you permission. Uh, your laptop yeah. will do the job. Totally. And you print it or out. Or your typewriter. <laughs> or your, or, your, or yeah. your yellow pages. Yeah, amazing. Your yellow pads. Well, Rob Cohen, man, I, I, I'd love to have you back someday and we can dig into some of your other films. Um, but I just have so much admiration for you. You're, you're an artist and a visionary, and it's, it's a true honor to be your friend. And I've looked up to you for so long, and I know so many amazing things are in store for you. And, and I hope one day we get to do a movie together. You know, like I have so much respect for everything you've done in your life. And next movie you're going to be in. It. Yeah, Don't man. Worry. I, I, we'll I, find something. I can't wait to see what you do next. And, and I'm so excited for all that's to come. And, and keep inspiring, man. You know, you, you're, you're, you're such an icon. And, it, oh. Thank you for all you do, man. I'm just a guy who loves movies and <laughs> loves making them and loves working with the people that help me make them. Well, it shows, brother, and I'm so excited, and I love you, man. Thanks for being here. Feelings mutual, Yeah. Man. Thank you. Rock and roll. Have fun? Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> fun, fun talk. <laughs>